Welcome to On The Whistle, Africa's biggest and best fry. I'm your host, Alistair Howarth, and today we are joined by none other than Tom Senthiet, head coach of the Scorpions of Gambia, the glorious underdogs of AFCON 2021, the lowest ranked side in the history of the Africa Cup of Nations, made it all the way to the quarterfinals, and we're delighted to have Tom come join us today. Coach, how are you doing today? Hey, good afternoon. I'm fine. Thank you. How are you? Uh, doing doing really well excited for this chat I mean we were just talking before you know I wanted to ask you a bit about your kind of football playing career and I was you know my line of questioning was all around you know what point did you you know finish your career and decide to to become a coach and stuff but you're saying actually you you wanted to be a coach the whole whole time uh, t- tell me a bit about that naturally uh you want to play as a young kid I was nine years old when I when I became a member of a football club the local club here in Molesport after four years I made already a transfer to a bigger club and uh, in the youth, I made some movements to, to Premier League and second league teams in, in Belgium. Uh, made it then to the, the, the second team of a, of a Premier League team and then uh, went to a third division team. Um, but um, I had always the knowledge that I would be not a top class player. I mean, I would never reach uh, the top teams in Belgian Premier League. I would never become a Belgian national team player. So that was always in my mind. And uh, um, by the age of, we have to go to, to to high school till 18 in Belgium. And by the age of 17, you have to write, uh, think about writing a script and a thesis uh, in, in the last year, year of school. And I was sitting in an economical direction, but my thesis was about football and coaching. And that was quite unique because everyone had economical topics and and I had something totally not related to uh, what I was studying in school. But I knew I wanted to become a coach. I discussed that time already with my coach uh, at the club a lot. And um, later my dad said, okay, uh, as a player, you, you will not become a millionaire. Um, you need to combine your football with, with study in university. And then I chose really uh, on the age of 18 to, to study psychology uh, with the idea that uh, psychology could be very important as a coach. And uh, I got my degree in sport and business psychology a few years later. But I always combined it with football. I, uh, after my study, I went to Faroe Islands to play football for Koi Klaxwick. Uh, fantastic experience and also Tebe Twera. Um, but it were difficult times also financially in Faroe Islands. And I, I moved back. I played one year more in Belgium. But um, the, 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 the red line or the red uh, thing through my, through my career as a football player were injuries. I'm 16 years old. Uh, I played that time in Gale. Uh, with the likes of Pat Gore, former national team captain. Um, I had already my first cruciate ligament injury. And uh, from that moment, I had, as a player, four times a cruciate ligament injury. And I have, uh, as a coach, I got it two times more. So in total, I had six times cruciate ligament injury and three times the ankle ligament. So I was a lot of times injured. I was a lot of times recovering from injuries out. Um, so the fun of playing uh, was, was soon over. And I got some offers to play in, in lower leagues in Belgium to earn decent money. Uh, but I, I was not impressed in that. I said, okay, when as a player I can't reach the top I want to reach, uh, it's better to, to say goodbye to it. I was the age of 23 and uh, I was looking for a coaching job. And I started immediately as a head coach on the age of 24. At that time, the youngest ever Belgian head coach in the lower leagues in, in Belgian football. Uh, I was already studied. I uh, started at the uh, age of 23 with my coaching uh, licenses my, to get my badges because on the age of 24, I had my B license. On the age of 26, I had my A license already, UEFA A license. So it went fast. And even after that, I went to go and study in Holland, uh, physical coaching license, skill development coach. So the whole step from the age of 16, 17, uh, okay, there was still the, the ambition to try to reach as far as possible as a player. But knowing that the top would be not realistic Uh, I was already planning on that age uh, a coaching career Mm. and and the other thing you mentioned is that right from the off you know you had a desire to to play and coach outside of of Belgium you know what was your first experience of coaching out of outside of Belgium and then eventually outside of Europe and how did that come about yeah, the, 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 there are there are two reasons. I, I'm, I'm as a kid, I, I traveled a lot with my family, and 
I um, I saw the world and I, I really love the world. I mean, uh, I'm not a Belgian. I, I'm a member of, of the world and I, I can live and cope everywhere. And, and I love so many places on this planet because people are so fantastic everywhere where you come. You have nice people and, 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 and the countries and the cultures, the landscapes, everything is so, so interesting to see. Um, but as a coach, um, I, I was the first uh, three, four years working in Belgium. Um, working to get up on, on the ladder, I did a lot of things. I worked uh, always as a head coach in the lower leagues, combined with a youth coach in the second highest league in Belgium and scouting for, for Mechelen, KV Mechelen, one of the bigger clubs in the Belgian Premier League. Uh, so I did really, I worked already full time uh, on the age of 26, 27 in combination of different uh, coaching and scouting roles uh, at that moment. But my ambition was to work on the highest level and to work with the best players. And at that time, we talk about the 90s and 90s. Um, that was really something strange. A guy of 26, 27 who, who want a, a coaching role on top level as a professional. Uh, I remember that I sent my first fax uh, for the young viewers. At the time, there was no internet. Um, people uh, could send letters by post, you get phone, but you could send also a paper by fax, what came immediately out by the other side. Um, I sent my first fax to apply to the Zimbabwe Federation on the age of 26 to apply for the national team head coach role. And I have still that fax uh, somewhere in my archive. So uh, it's quite funny because I knew that in Belgium, it would be very tough to, 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 to work on the level I wanted. Um, I first got the offer to go to Ivory Coast, uh, Satellite Abidjan, uh, through an agent. I was at 27. I went there, was also announced there as coach. But at that time, there will be a start of the civil war. And um, both family as, as uh, embassy people uh, advised me not to return to, to Ivory Coast. So that was my first experience, uh, a little bit short and uh, not really uh, getting off to start. Um, but uh, a few months later, I got a call from Faroe Islands where I played uh, before uh, to start with B71 and I was 28 years old, head coach of a, um, a club, a full-time head coach of a club in, in Faroe Islands. And I'm very thankful that I, on that age, got that opportunity uh, to work on a full-time base in, internationally. And from that step, it went easier. I, I, I got a little bit later a phone call from Jan Street, former Dutch national team player, played the World Cup 78 uh, final against Argentina with Holland. Uh, he was at that time head coach in the second highest league in Holland and he asked me to be his assistant. I did that on temporary base because I had still an agreement in Ferroines for a second year. And a little bit later, I got a call from Walter Meus, former national team coach of Belgium and former player of Ajax Amsterdam, Club Rouge, Thunder Liège, and uh, played the World Cup 82 and qualified as national team coach Belgium uh, for the 1990 uh, World Cup. Um, he called me to become his assistant coach in Qatar. That was uh, 2003. Uh, and he that was just starting the Star League in Qatar, the first year of, of the big league in Qatar with the likes of uh, Batistuta, Hierro, Gordiola, um, Effenberg, Pasler, Frank Leboeuf, uh, Claudio Canicia. They were all there. Also Jamel Belmadi and, and Kabadi Awara, current coaches. And I went with Walter to Ali Tihad, currently Al Garafa. I was 30 years old and I worked in a star league with uh, top class players from all over the world. And quite funny, uh, I was uh, later, I was shortly interim head coach. And so I worked with two players who are now national team coaches. Jamel Belmadi, the current coach of Algeria, was my player in Qatar. And also Kaba Diawara, the current uh, national team coach of Guinea Conakry, was uh, my player in Qatar. But at that time, I was 30 years old. Um, it was a fantastic experience. But because of these uh, first steps abroad, you get easier offers uh, from other countries. The advantages, I, I speak fluently English, French, German and Dutch. Uh, and, and, and adapt very easy to other languages like Arabic, F Finnish, Farish. Uh, so I, I speak a lot of languages. Uh, the first four languages I speak uh, almost perfect. Uh, the other I understand and, and can say some football uh, coaching terms. Um, but I think uh, from one went the other. And yeah, I'm, I'm quite happy the way it moved. But clear also, I wanted to become a coach on a young age. And I had always the ambition to become national team coach. Um, I know there are a lot of, of players who, 
who are playing and get an injured on a later age or, or retire and then they think what what I can do and then they become a coach without any planning without any education without any uh, earlier ambition to do it my whole life was almost from teenage age uh, till till now a plan to become a coach uh, because as I said I have my UEFA B UEFA A license then later UEFA Pro license um, of, uh, Dutch physical coach license three one two and one uh, skill development coach license I'm a uh, sport psychologist. So a lot of things were made in, in, all with the goal of, of, a, of a becoming a top coach and step by step also building on that career and naturally then working abroad uh, in different countries helped also um, yeah, to open new doors because people know you can adapt to countries and you speak the languages and naturally if you don't perform somewhere or you have a bad attitude, uh, the door would have been early closed. Uh, but I think uh, the quality of my work and my attitude um, made that every time, step by step, I grew. And uh, national team coaching job was always the dream, the ambition. Um, I'm, I talk always very frank about it. I want to go to the World Cup. Uh, that's my main goal as a national team coach. Um, and, and, and that was also the reason that on the age of 26, I even applied already for a national team coaching, head coaching job. Oh, that's that's incredible. I, I mean, just just on that, you know, why why did you always want to be a national team coach instead of, say, a club coach? Is there, you know, was it just the glamour of the World Cup in your mind or, or, or kind of their specifics? Because you've 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 coached some club, you know, clubs in the past. And, you know, even in Africa, you've coached sides, you know, like Free State Stars, Yanga and stuff. But, you you know, especially recently, it's generally been international teams. So where where is that kind of desire come from? Yeah. Yeah, to be honest, I, I have a very good sets as, as a club coach. I, I worked in Holland uh, with FC Emmen, um, now Premier League in Holland back. Um, I'm the one who, one of the people who discovered Bas Dost, uh, former top scorer of Germany and, and uh, Portugal, second behind Messi uh, a few years ago in the, in the Golden Boot um, in Europe. Um, uh, I was, when he was 17, 18 years old, I was his coach and technical director who gave his first contract. I worked in Finland, I worked in Germany. Uh, I coached in Belgium, a, a league to the promotion playoffs. I coached in Jordan, where I reached the second spot with Shabab al um in the league. And in Yanga, I'm the last coach who, who won the Sikafa Cup. It's a little bit the Champions League from Eastern Central Africa. I'm the last coach who, who won that cup for Yanga in Tanzania. So, uh, And also in South Africa, I, uh, I guided uh, the Free State Stars uh, to an 11th spot at that moment when, when I had to leave the club. Um, so I have good statistics as a club coach but for me um, a World Cup is the highest you can achieve. Um, every year there is a Champions League and, and naturally there are some teams like Chelsea and like uh, Manchester United, Manchester City, Real Madrid, Barcelona, Inter Milan, AC Milan and these kinds of countries they are world class and well known but there are also a lot of clubs who reach Champions League but the years later uh, everyone will forget a World Cup is, is something unique. It's every four years, and I'm also happy it stays every four years. It makes it more exclusive, more unique, and it's the highest of the highest you can achieve. There are only there are a million of clubs, a million of professional coaches in clubs all over the world, but there are only 211 football countries, so 211 national team coaches, and there will be only 34 at the World Cup. So it, it, it makes it more exclusive and working with the best players of a country, uh, having the responsibility because as a club coach, um, uh, Otmar Hisfeld said once, um, they asked him what is the difference between coaching Bayern München, Dortmund or, or Switzerland at the time he was national team coach of Switzerland. He said, when you coach Bayern München, um, you have the whole year some stress, but if you lose a match, a week later you win and everyone forgot that you lost the match. Um, as national team coach, maybe the whole year the stress is less, but when you have a game, the stress is so much higher than a, an, an, the national, than a club coach, even than Bayern Munich, because the whole country, um, you can be a fan of an, any club in the world, um, but, but all the people in one country are fan of their nation. When their country plays, every grandmother, every child, uh, every, every, every boy and girl is a fan of their country, of their national team and support them. So the pressure is so high, the demands are so high as a national team coach. And if you lose, 
sometimes it's two, three months, no, no, no follow-up game. So your last game is standing there. You win or you lose, and that's the last what people keep in memory. And you have no time to to change that result. And that that tension, that stress, that responsibility, I really like. I, I like to to to. I, for me, it's a very big honor to represent the country, to guide a national team, and and the stress, the power, the pressure around it is, is really something I, I really like. And uh, sometimes I uh, miss more frequently games. It was fantastic to play the Africa Cup and to feel uh, every few days the tension of a game. And for sure, when you go into the second round and quarter final, the tension gets higher. Uh, sometimes I miss and, and I think maybe I have to make the move to club football. But I know when I'm a club coach, I miss a national team coaching. So uh, yeah, I feel good in that. Mm, I, I like that. You know, the, the World Cup st stays with you for four years, for better or for worse. <laughs> Uh, yeah, the, the, the pressure is there. I mean, again, looking at your your CV, you know, you've coached, you know, all over the world, the Americas, Europe, Asia. But the one thing that always kind of strikes me is you're always coming back to Africa. You're always coming back, back to the continent to, to take on national teams. You know, why is it that you, you know, you keep coming back to African country? What is it about it? The, you know, the continent, the countries, or is it just a coincidence? You know, what is it about it that, that makes you keep coming back? Let me say that I, I worked everywhere with pleasure. I mean, um, I, I feel home in Asia, in the Arab world. I feel home in, 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 the, in the Caribbean world and I feel home in Europe and in Africa. Everywhere I worked with fantastic people in federations with pleasure, with good players and a fantastic staff in beautiful countries. So I have everywhere very good memories. Um, but what is unique on Africa is, is the quality. Um, and I said that already more than 10 years ago. And for me, African countries uh, can become world champion if they appoint the right coach. Um, but it's, it's, it's quite sad that the powerhouses in African football most of the time make the wrong choices in, in, in choosing a coach around World Cup. Uh, now also some of the big nations like Nigeria are talking uh, about Laurent Blanc, Cocu, uh, Valverde, uh, Pereiro all coaches who never in their life coached in Africa, who are only applying in Africa because they can't find a job anymore in Europe. They are desperate and they want the big money of a country as Nigeria. Um, if they had offers in Europe, they would not apply in Nigeria. They have no passion, they have no, no, no knowledge of African football and they don't know how to perform. It happens many times when Selen Horan Eriksson took over Ivory Coast uh, in the 2010 World Cup. He failed. Lars Lagerbeck lost every match with Nigeria before in the 2010 World Cup. Working in Africa uh, is also working with the people, knowing, understanding the culture, getting the maximum out of players. And for me, uh, there is so much talent in African football. There is so much quality. We see it in the European leagues. The major players of European football clubs are most of the time African players. So that's already a first sign of the talent. Um, and, and working with these talented players, trying to achieve something is really fantastic. Plus the, the football culture, the passion of the game. I really like it. But like I said, I enjoyed working in, in Asia, in the Arab world. I enjoyed working in Europe, everywhere. But, but Africa, for sure. Um, in theory, uh, the, the powerhouses of African football, and then I talk about Cameroon, Nigeria, Ghana, Ivory Coast, plus Senegal, uh, Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria, and Egypt. These nine countries, they can play to reach a semi-final in the World Cup and why not the final and maybe become world champion. If they have the right coach who gets the maximum out of them with the right formation, the right strategy, um, who really has knowledge of the culture, how to work with the players, he, he can do that. That's possible. Um, and, and, and that's my dream. I want to go with an African country to the World Cup and on that World Cup, not to be there, but to be the Gambia uh, of a World Cup with, with an African country, to be surprising the whole world and reaching further than everyone ever could expect. And I really believe it's possible. Mm, I, I, I'm looking forward to that when that when that happens. I mean, looking now to, to the AFCOM where you did do that with Gamba, you know, you went further than I think all of us, except for maybe yourself, expected. Because I remember you came onto the podcast before the, the AFCON kicked off 
And I was struck by how confident you were. You know, you're like, we're going to do very well. You know, you, you had complete faith in the team, but you also you said, you know, the main purpose was to come and learn and kind of take from the experience. You know, what, what, what did you learn from, from the experience? Yeah, naturally, it was a fantastic experience. It was a fantastic tournament. Uh, almost all our games was a lot of people in the crowd. Uh, we celebrated football to them and starting with a victory against Mauritania that day, a lot of people from the Gambia Federation came to me and say, coach, even if we lose now every game, our tournament is, is, is already fantastic. And uh, working with the players uh, day in, day out, because as a national team coach uh, with foreign-based players, it's not always easy. I see my players sometimes one day before a match only, and then we have to be ready for it. And now I could work longer with the team. We had some struggles in the pre, pre uh, in the in the preparation. We were in Qatar, trained once with eleven people without goalkeeper because everyone else had COVID. Um, also, staff members, ten people of the staff had COVID. So we learned um, uh, to 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 work in a tournament. I had previous experience in tournament because even the Sikafa Cup with uh, with Yanga is a tournament where a group stage with four teams and then uh, quarterfinal, semifinal. So I have a, a very good, um, I think, a very good um, uh, level of of coaching in tournaments, uh, understanding how to prepare a team also tactically and counting what is needed. Um, but we learned that that everything is possible for ourselves. Um, we, we had, before the tournament, we had played Algeria, Morocco, we drew and we won against them. Uh, we had played Gabon and all these, and we had good results. But in a tournament, there's other tensions. Uh, how do the team going to react? How do the players going to react on that? Can they cope with the stress or not? And, and, and it, it gave so much confidence. The only risk now looking to the future is because the expectations are now much higher. No one sees us anymore as an underdog. Uh, everyone in Gambia think we're going to become world champion in the next five years. Uh, what is not realistic, naturally. And also qualifying for every Africa Cup is not, not a given. I mean... Um, you, you, you saw it on Madagascar and Burundi who, did, who qualified for the 2019 World Cup, did it well, of Africa Cup and did it quite well, but were not for the 2021. So for me now, I know the quality of my players. Sadly enough, some of the experienced players stopped their career. I think about uh, Ibrima uh, Sona, I think about uh, Pamudu Jang, the captain. Uh, and it's, it's sad that we had to say goodbye to them, but we knew about that before the tournament. Um, we have to build a little bit a new team, but the most important thing is, uh, except of the belief that we can do it, is also keep our feet on the ground and, and knowing that the way we got there was not an easy way and was not because we were a powerhouse in football. We are not yet a powerhouse in football. We are a small football nation who surprised Africa and the world on the Africa Cup. And when we start in June, in a few weeks' time, again, our qualification, we have to start with that in mind. We are still the underdog. We are still only 123 in the world. We improved 49 positions in the last three and a half years, but we are still, there are still 122 countries better than us, and there are still 23 African countries better than us, and in our group are two countries who are higher ranked than us. So that's so important. And if, if we can manage that, if we can manage the expectations of the people, because it looks now that if we play Brazil or Argentina, still people expect us to win. But if we can manage the expectations, then we can, uh, can achieve again. And for me, the big task is now uh, to qualify again for the 2023 AFCON. Um, and, and that will be already more difficult than what we did in AFCON because uh, we are not the underdog, as I said, but we learned a lot. We, we enjoyed it a lot. We experienced a lot. We learned some things in our own preparation. Um, and and uh, But we learned also how strong we are. And we learned also that we have really potential to compete with the best on the highest level.